Hello, everybody. This is Bill McKibben from 350.org. What a pleasure to be speaking with you all. I've, of course, followed Plant for the Planet for a very long time, back from Felix's uh, early days with all of this, and been really happy to watch it grow not only in reach and uh, uh, power and scope, but in sophistication to the point where you guys are carrying on conversations um, this week at Touching Castle on the most, well, the most important questions that we face. How are we going to make this planet work for 10 billion people? And, of course, on current trajectories, we're not going to make it work. If we keep raising the temperature anything like it's going up at the moment, the planet will be largely uninhabitable, and that's the great problem that we faced, the one that I started writing about. I wrote the first book about climate change 26 years ago now. Um, but there is no need, at least I think, to be entirely pessimistic. Uh, I've become more optimistic even over the course of the last year, and I'll tell you why. Um, we've built this big climate movement, about which more in a moment, but as we've done that work, the other people who've been doing their work are the engineers. And they've managed finally to get renewable energy, solar power especially, but wind and things too, down to the point where it's economically competitive with fossil fuel, where we could run the world efficiently and cheaply on the sun and the wind. And that's the great hope that we can make that transition happen fast enough. We can see signs in a few places. I mean, you're there in Germany where the big country that's done the most to kind of make this change and there were days last summer when the Germans generated 80% of their electricity from the sun. That's a good sign. It's an even better sign that Costa Rica managed over the first three months of this year to take uh, use all of its electricity from renewable sources. It's an even better sign that uh, Bangladesh is one of the poorest countries in the world, Bangladesh. They're installing 60 or 70,000 new solar systems a month. They think the entire country will be solarized by 2021. So when the world comes together in Paris in December, I think that the absolute A number one point of uh, discussion has got to be how do we provide the financing, the money quickly from the rich countries of the world to the poor countries to let them make this leap fast, fast, fast to go past, go straight to using renewable energy without building a lot of coal-fired power plants in the interim. Just the same way that they were able to uh, go straight to cell phones, you know, 15 years ago. If we can do that with energy, then we have a shot. Not at stopping global warming, it's too late for that, and as you all know, some of these consequences are irreversible, but perhaps at keeping it from getting completely, completely out of control. Now, as the engineers are doing their thing and spreading these new technologies, our other job is to hold down, break the power of the fossil fuel industry. The coal and gas and oil guys are not giving up without a fight. They're the richest industry on earth. And so they're doing all they can to sabotage efforts to bring renewable energy to the fore. They have a lot of money that they use to fund politicians. Um, that's why around the world, young people in particular are taking the lead in this campaign for divestment from stocks of fossil fuel to get colleges, schools, churches, synagogues, mosques, uh, you name it, to sell their stock in coal and gas and oil companies as a powerful statement that they don't want to be involved with them. Um, college is the place where this has been most powerful so far. And colleges from Stanford to Sydney to Stockholm to Scotland to Syracuse, to you name it, have been engaged. I was just spent last week in Harvard Yard uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the States where students were sitting in occupying the office of their president to demand change. These are great young leaders, people 
worth emulating and paying attention to. Um, um, we don't need you at your age to be going to jail. We do need you to be pushing hard, 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 um, um, making it clear that these companies are the enemies of the future. And that's why, you know, at 350.org, we work so hard all over the world for a kind of solidarity. Um, we'll make sure to send you some images and some pictures from the work, not only the kind of big, beautiful scenes like the 400,000 people walking through the streets of New York last September in the Great People's Climate March, the biggest demonstration about anything in the United States in a very long time, but also the pictures from that same month of our brothers and sisters in the Pacific, indigenous people on those islands that may disappear this century, building traditional canoes and then taking them to Australia to blockade the largest coal port in the world. We're serious about shutting down the fossil fuel industry, at least its expansion, its new mines, its new fracking wells, its new pipelines. We're serious about that, and we need everybody engaged in this fight. It's, uh, for those of you who think about these things in this way, it's a kind of pincers movement. On the one hand, we're slowing down the fossil fuel industry. On the other hand, the engineers are making renewable energy ever cheaper and more available. If we both work hard on these things at the same time, then we have a chance. So I hope that I get to see some of you in Paris, um, and that when I do, you're engaged in the discussions inside the conference hall, but that you're also out marching with us in the streets because it's in those movements that we build the political power stands up to the money of the fossil fuel industry. So, enjoy Germany, enjoy your discussions, do this important work and do it in collaboration with people, many of them from the poorest parts of the world who are standing up in every corner of our beautiful planet. Thank you all very much for your work.